16 tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. <coughs> That's our text. Last week we kind of finished up looking at the resurrection. And last week specifically, uh, the, two weeks ago we saw uh, convincing evidence of the resurrection. And last week we looked at the manner of of the resurrection, the way that the resurrection is actually going to happen. We saw the um, that the um, arguments against the resurrection, we saw that death has to happen in order for there to be new life, so the quickening, uh, and we saw that the resurrection of the dead is just like when a uh, just like when a seed is planted in the ground, it has to die in order to be quickened or to be made alive. And, it, and when it's quickened, it doesn't come back the way that it was. So we saw the contrast between the physical and the spiritual. We're living in today in a temporal or a dishonorable body. We're a corrupt body. And it, we're sown in corruption, but we're raised in incorruption. And that's something that I've just kind of uh, it was a thought that I've been meditating on in the last week. It's just a wonderful thing, isn't it, that a corrupt body can be sown, but because of the first atom, we have corruption. Because of the second atom, we have quickening. And so when Christ makes us alive, He makes us alive incorruptible. And that's, that's a joyous truth. We're moving forward. Uh, our conclusion last week was to be steadfast, unmovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And that's the practical aspect of it. Someday we're going to be made alive, and so stick by the stuff and keep on working for Jesus is the conclusion. I'm glad that no spiritual truth is without practical uh, ramifications or a practical way to live it. And it helps us. The way you think affects what you do. And uh, so here we are in chapter 16. We'll uh, just read... Verses, uh, I say, 1 through uh, 5. And that will be our context and text for tonight. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. Now I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass. I do pass through Macedonia. Okay. Father, uh, please help us this evening to understand uh, the collection and the ministry and uh, the biblical process of giving from context here this evening. I pray that it would be enlightening, freeing, and challenging for us this evening. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is every preacher's dream text, you know. <laughs> just can't wait to talk about money. And, uh, you know, it just I just get so excited. Actually, not really, but actually, uh, I, I do, I do um, not mind at all preaching about giving in the Scripture. Let me just qualify a couple of things this evening, and you'll... If you've been in our ministry for any amount of time, you'll know that this is true. Uh, I don't really ask our people to give in our church. And by that, what I mean is tithing and so forth. I, uh, I'm i not one of those preachers. I actually hear quite often, and it, it, it puts me off just a little bit, it puts off a lot of people. I hear that when you go to churches, you know, one of the things that, that is preached about a lot is giving. And I can certainly understand that. I have... Uh, friends in the ministry whose churches are in a lot of financial trouble. And, uh, you know, they feel like it falls on them to be able to raise the funds for the ministry. And that's too bad. There are churches that are in terrible debt. I just want to say a couple things about our church. Uh, we've had the privilege, I've had the privilege of getting to pastor this church from the beginning. And the advantage of that, there's there's advantage and there's a disadvantage. The advantage is you don't have to correct anyone else's mistakes. The disadvantage is that you're responsible for everything that does need to be corrected. You're the one that made the mistake. And so that's the disadvantage. There have been times 
uh, in, in our church when I've recognized things and just looking at our ministry, I thought, you know, I don't like that about our ministry. It's sort of a uh, revelation the way it is to a parent when you see an attitude in your child. And you're like, whoa, bad attitude. Now, where did they learn that? And then you realize where they learned it. And you realize, oh, <laughs> that's a reflection of me. And it really kind of uh, reflects poorly on me, that attitude. And I've, I've had those experiences in our ministry a few times when I realized, you know, uh, wow, people are disrespectful. Where did they get that from? Or people are uncompassionate. Where did that come from? Or people are whatever. And then you realize, okay, well, you know, not always. I mean, obviously everyone's an individual sinner. They, they can come up with their own sin. I'm not saying you, you can only sin the scope of what you learn from your pastor. I'm sure you folks are more capable than that. But the reality of it is, is that a lot of times a ministry, when it has a temperament or a personality to it, and, and especially if it's not a good thing, sometimes we have to own it as a pastor. And being a church planter, I have the privilege of that. One of the things being a church planter that I have the privilege of is, is pastoring a church that's debt-free. And I uh, really, really value that. And... Um, Man, I'll tell you, I'm not sure that I have the temperament to pastor a church that's deeply in debt. I'm not sure. I just think that the burden of a way... If, if, I, if our church were deeply in debt, my goal would be to get out of debt as quickly as possible. And that would consume my ministry. And that's too bad. And I think that, I think that there are good folks, we could say, whose ministries are consumed by the fact that they're in an unbiblical amount of debt. And I'm, I, again, I'm not preaching against debt this evening. But I want to just explain our perspective. You don't hear me speak very much about giving. Sometimes when we're giving in our church toward a special project, like this fall, uh, by the way, if you haven't read it yet, there's a nice letter from Brother Bill Fennell about the uh, gift that our church was able to, to, we were able to give them a year of support, and that was just through special giving in our church. Sometimes I'll ask a church to say, you know, we'd like to give a year of support. We'd like to give $1,200. And every now and again, I'll just crunch numbers. And I'll say on Sunday morning, say there are 60 of us here and we want to give uh, $1,200. Well, if, um, if 60 people gave $50 each, then what? That's 3000 Yeah, that'd be $3,000. So we don't need to give $50 each. Yeah. So if 60 people gave $20 each, then that'd be $1,200. And, you know, $20 is not so insurmountable, actually, is it? I mean, a child could probably come up with $20 if they really wanted to give. So sometimes I'll say something like that. I'll crunch numbers. And I'll say, well, if we need $3,000 of 60 people or whatever, we just, and just throw numbers out and just, you know, $50 is not so, such a reach. Is it for people that want to give sacrificially? If you needed to, if it were life or death and you needed to come up with $50, most people could come up with $50. Okay, but I don't do that very often, do, do I? Um, how many times do you hear me talk about tithing? Never. Josiah's taking notes this evening, and uh, the word grace we're going to talk about a lot this evening. I just said it so you can put it down. Grace, grace, grace. Put it down four times. <laughs> All right. Uh, he's taking notes of how many times you use a word. And if he had the word tithe on there, uh, and he were keeping track, I've said it several times this evening, but I don't ever really use the word tithe in our church. You may ever notice that? And when we take up our offering on Sunday mornings, I don't say tithes and offerings, and I don't say tithe very much. Everybody notice that? Why is that? Why do you suppose that is? What's that? Yeah, John? I think as, as a New Testament giver, I would be ashamed if I didn't give at least a tithe, and our offering yeah. might be more than that. Yeah, I, I personally think a tither is a little bit of a skin flint. Uh, but, but the truth of the matter is, is that the tithe isn't really taught in the New Testament. <laughs> Now, I want to qualify because we're not going there again, so I just want to qualify what I said just a minute ago. The tithe is not abolished in the New Testament either. In other words, when Jesus commended the Pharisees, He commended them because they were so copious or so careful in their tithing that they tithed actually on their herbs. Whereas they tithe, and they were so specific about it. While they were being so careful about their tithing, they were rebuked for overlooking gross sins of the heart. In other words, you know, and the reality of it is, is that, you know, there's some pretty nasty temperamented tithers. Actually, who feel justified? 
I'm a supporting member of this church. And so that's why it's okay for me to be nasty to some people. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? Not, not here. We don't have anyone like that here. Nobody tithes in our church. So <laughs> don't worry about it. No. Okay, so uh, the reality of it, though, is that the tithe is taught in the Old Testament of the Scripture. And the purpose of the tithe was primarily for the support of the Levites. The Levites did not have a land inheritance. They had a spiritual inheritance. So when the tribes came into Israel, uh, each of them had their allotment, but not the tribe of Levi. They sojourned. They lived in cities. And it was their duty when their time came up for them to go and to serve in the temple and minister for the things of the temple. And so the Levites were supported by the other tribes of Israel. And actually that was a pretty good deal. The reality of it is that it would it is was that serving in the temple was a lot of work. And it wasn't something you could do casually. It was something that if you did the way it ought to be done, it was a full-time thing for those that it was their course or their lot to serve in the temple. And so it made sense. So the, the Levites were supported by tithe. They were supported by some of the offerings that were offered. And they had a portion that went to them. They were supported by the finances that were tithed. And so that was the allotment of the Levites. Where are the Levites today in the church? Well, we don't have any. Now, we do have some that minister, though, don't we, in the church. In other words, and that would be one of the reasons for supporting a ministry. In other words, I am perfectly fine with earning my own support. Uh, but if I were to earn my own support, well, there would be things that I could not do in the ministry. And so it's a, it's a decision. Matter of fact, for church planting, I tell a lot of guys, I think it's ideal for guys to be bivocational, where they work a job and uh, where they also pastor a church, where they do both. Maybe they're uh, two-thirds of their time they're working to support themselves. But when the ministry grows, then the demands of the ministry demand their time as well. Uh, for, let, me, let, me, let me give you, for instance, for, I was very convinced when we started our church that uh, a pastor should be full-time. And that's just the way that I did. I just trust the Lord by faith and uh, was full-time in the ministry. Uh, but when we first started our church, there wasn't a lot of ministry. And I soon realized that now I just did stuff. I went out and did door hangers every day. Mrs. Price and I did. We just went out every single day and knocked on doors. And so we put a lot of time into reaching people. But it took a while to find people to minister to. And man, anybody that would call and say, Pastor, you know, somebody could talk to me. Man, I was all over that. It's like, yeah, ministry. It's a great opportunity. Today it isn't that way. Today there's plenty of ministry. I feel like I uh, neglect the ministry in many ways. Like I don't uh, do good enough service to the ministry. So the idea of working at, uh, another job today when, you, when I'm pastoring two churches is a little bit too much. Okay, now... We asked the question, what's the purpose of the tithe? Well, the purpose of the tithe was to uh, pay for the temple, to pay for the Levites. And honestly, we don't have those today, but we do have ministers. Previously, when we were preaching through 1 Corinthians, uh, we saw Paul's defense of his apostleship. And one of the things uh, that he said, and let's just, let's just go back to chapter 9. One of the things that Paul defended was his right to be supported by the ministry. And so I, I, I want to just point this out this evening because uh, some Christians overlook it completely. Some people say, well, you know, a pastor ought to support himself. And I think it's fine for a preacher to make the decision to do that, but it's also biblical for a preacher or a minister to, to be supported as well. So let's look at this. Um, Paul said in verse... 3 of chapter 9. He said, Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat to drink? He said, Is it not my right? So their idea of power is, Do I not have the right? Do, is, is it, do I not have the right to eat or drink? You say, Pastor, not as much as you do. <laughs> um, well, you know, do, do, should, should a preacher be allowed to eat? Should he be allowed to drink? And, you know, by drink, I don't mean the colloquial. I mean water or something appropriate. Verse 5. Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Or I only and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? Paul said, would it be okay if I didn't do secular work? 
Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not the milk of the flock? Say these things as a man? Or saith not the law the same thing also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the, ox, <coughs> the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Is, is the fellow in, in uh, Atlanta that's been all over the news the last week for buying his wife uh, a Lamborghini? Where's the guy at? I think it's Atlanta, isn't it? Or Louisiana or something like that. I can't remember where the guy is. That's a little controversial, isn't it? Now, I think my wife does deserve at least a Ferrari, if not a Lamborghini. But she hasn't asked for one, so I won't be asking our church <laughs> to support me at the level uh, of being able to do that. Uh, you can rest assured that uh, if we had a Lamborghini in our house, we got it for free somewhere. <laughs> okay, uh, that's lavish. Uh, last year when, uh, what's his face, uh, Duplantis said that he needed a $50 million jet to be able to, was it $55 million, whatever it was. And he, when he said that if Jesus did ministry today, he wouldn't ride a donkey, he'd, ride a, he'd have a, you know, at least a $55 million dollar jet. Well, my friends, that's nonsense, isn't it? Anybody with, with half a brain ought to be able to see through that. Paul is not saying, you know, do you have the right to eat gold-plated food? He's saying, should a guy be able to eat? And the answer to that is yes. You ought to be able to live as well as the people he ministers to. That's fair enough. Should he have to pay for his own travel? Should a guy have to pay to serve? Well, the law contradicts that because it was considered immoral and it was against the law for Israel when an ox treaded out the corn to put a muzzle on him to keep him from putting his tongue down and licking up grain. Because the laborer is worthy of his hire. That's the idea there. And so Paul said, you know what, if, I, if, I've, if I have uh, sown the gospel and I've reaped you, then I should be able to live off of it. And that's fair enough. And then he also said, do we have the right to forbear working? Do I have the right not to work? And then he talked about how he hadn't used his... Right. In other words, he had foregone. He, he decided, I won't take support from the church at Corinth. And that was his right to do. Okay. Now, so we understand Paul is saying, I have the right to be supported, but I don't, I'm not necessarily saying that I have to be. So I think it's an individual thing, isn't it? For uh, a church and the, the relationship that it has as far as supporting its minister. I've always been embarrassed to be a beggar. I'm not talking about from the position of a pastor. But I don't want to be charity. There are some guys, some pastors, that use the fact that they're a pastor to try to get a discount for everything. And I, that's just annoying to me. I just think, well, you know, a pastor's a person. And if you don't expect to be held to a, a ridiculous standard as a person, then you better be careful about holding people to taking, caring for you or treating you with a particular regard. Do you understand that? In other words... Uh, I was out, we were out soul winning last night, and a guy talked to me about. Uh, he apologized for cursing. Uh, he apologized for cursing to me, and he said, "You know, I didn't realize you were a pastor when I was cursing." And uh, you know, and I said, "Well, I'm really I'm, I'm a Christian." And I said, "The reason I don't take the name of the Lord in vain, the reason I don't swear, is because as not as a pastor, but as a Christian, I'll be held accountable for it." And I said, "That's that's an individual." So, so I said, "You know, I bother you for your own sake, not for mine." Whereas it doesn't even offend me, really. It uh, really just, it, it, that's something that you'll answer to God for. That'll be your concern. Don't be concerned about me. I'm not making some kind of judgment. I'm a person. And uh, sometimes people think, well, you know, your title, your office, you're a pastor. And so, you know, you must be perfect or something like that. Well, nearly. My wife thinks I'm, she, my wife says I'm just 1% just off, one notch off from total perfection. And if I stop throwing my socks, uh, you know, I'll have achieved it. And I'm just not sure I'm willing to give that up for the 100%. So anyway, the reality of it is that uh, a pastor is a Christian, right? And there are qualifications for a pastor, but uh, the right to be supported isn't because you're something super spiritual or something like that. It's because you serve. Because you work. And just like we... Um, would expect that somebody in a service type of a task or job that does something for us deserves to get paid. 
uh, then a pastor that serves us spiritually, ministers spiritual things, should be able to read carnal things. And if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you'll see that's what it's all about. Did I read verse 11? I'm not sure I did. Let's go there and let me read that real quick. Uh, verse 11, Paul said, If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap of your carnal things? And then he points out that other people do, and so he had the right to. Okay, let's go back to chapter 16. And then I want to look at a biblical uh, perspective on giving. Now, I did say that the emphasis in our church, we do not emphasize tithing. Uh, we emphasize giving or offering. Uh, Brother John pointed out, I think, he, I think he's the one, not me, that used the term miser or skin flint or something like that is a person that tithes. And shame on you for thinking so terribly of people, Brother John. I just happen to be in agreement with you about it. Uh, but the reality of it is, is that uh, tithing is obligatory. And while, the, and let me just say this, I, there are people that are railing against supporting churches right now against giving financially to churches, and against supporting pastors or ministers. Now, I will tell you that, that there are guys that I think are worthless. I don't think they ought to be supported. I think they're lazy. They don't work hard. Uh, they're not productive. They, they don't produce anything. And honestly, you know, if you, if you couldn't get away with that in a, uh, in a marketplace type of a job, you shouldn't get away with it in the ministry either. And so I certainly agree with that. Uh, I, some years ago, went to a preacher's fellowship and this pastor got up and he said his people were starving him out. They were trying to starve him out. And I had never heard that term before. I didn't know what that meant. So I asked him some questions about it and he said they'd stopped giving. And uh, I said, well, why did they do that? He said, well, they're hoping, you know, that I'll leave. And I thought, that's terrible. <laughs> that's really good. And what I thought was terrible is I thought, you must be a terrible pastor if your people want you to leave. And that's the reality of it. You know, I found this. This isn't always true. I know that not all church people are as nice and sweet as you are. But I found in the ministry that if you love people, generally speaking, they love you back. And usually if people don't like you, there's usually, you know, when, er when everyone in the church doesn't like you, um, usually it's not everyone in the church that's the problem. And if they are a problem, you're the guy that's supposed to help them with the problem, not the guy that's supposed to be opposed to them instead of helping them. And so I think there are guys that aren't worth supporting. I'll agree with that. And I suppose if that's the way to do it, then starve them out. That's just fine. Matter of fact, I actually know of a church or several right now that can't get rid of their pastors right now, I actually come to think of it. And that's their technique. They have a pretty substantial savings, and it's dwindling every month. And I know about it, actually, so come to think of it. That's ironic, but it does happen. I guess rather frequently. Um, what's the purpose of the collection? Are you in back in 1 Corinthians chapter 16? All right. I didn't finish. I keep rambling. Right, let me stop rambling. We're never going to get out of here. Um, I believe that there is a bit of a matter, though, that people have a problem with. In other words, they don't want to support churches today. Uh, matter of fact, most charitable giving isn't to churches, actually. Matter of fact, a lot of people in churches give uh, in other places, and I don't have a problem with that at all. I feel like if, if the, you're a steward of your finances and the Lord's laid on your heart what you should give and where you should give it, then go right on ahead. And that's just fine with me. I don't believe that we're in competition with anything when we have a God that owns everything, that has everything. And people that uh, just want to want to hold everything and have everything and act as though the people in the ministry are something that they own and they're entitled to uh, reap off of as though they belong to them. I think that's a bad spirit. It's a bad attitude about it. Miserly people have miserly results. Now, the tithing is not taught in the New Testament. You won't find it taught anywhere in the New Testament. But what I will say this, tithing is well established in the Old Testament, so there's not a lot of good reason to teach it in the New Testament. In other words, for people that would say, you know, Malachi, you know, bring you all the tithes in the storehouse, and, and uh, you know, when um, the, the Scripture teaches that, that they've robbed God and so forth, um, then tithing is something that we have to do in the New Testament. Well, let me ask you a practical question. If all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, 
In other words, I understand that tithing was for Israel. Tithing was for the Levites. Tithing was for the temple. I, we, we, I think we agree on that, don't we? Okay. Now, um, if tithing is to be no more at all, uh, what profit is there in Malachi today? In other words, if all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, at least the principle of the tithe ought to be a profit to us, shouldn't it? So that would be the first thing I'd say. Uh, so if you say, Pastor, you know, I didn't, I used the word tithe. I didn't know it's bad. It's not a bad word. It's a fine thing. Uh, and by the way, I don't, I'm joking when I think that tithers are skin flints. Uh, but people that, that give grudgingly don't have God's blessing. That's right. People that give grudgingly don't have God's blessing. And so if you give a tithe because you, you say, well, I have to, you don't understand, you don't understand giving. And, the second thing I was so so. First, tithing is not abolished in the New Testament. In other words, the New Testament doesn't say no tithing. And second, uh, all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Uh, and then also, I think I said this: tithing was very well established in the Old Testament. It would seem unnecessary or extra, wouldn't it? if the apostles spent a lot of time teaching tithing. I mean, it's pretty well established, wasn't it? In the Old Testament of the Scripture. And so it's not, it's certainly not something new. So the idea of someone saying, well, tithing's not taught in the New Testament, therefore do not tithe. Well, I think that would be a problem. So don't mistake what I'm saying this evening for my saying, I went to church Wednesday night, pastor said, stop tithing. Um... I'm not saying that at all. Now, I will make some statements this evening about tithing that if you want to take the wrong way, you could. Uh, well, I won't, I won't make them this evening. I'll tell you statements I've made in the past and I've been made aware that people took the wrong way. For instance, I've said to people, I just assume if you didn't want to give, you didn't. I've said that before. And there are people that stopped giving. And you know how much that affected me? I cried crocodile tears for months on end and, and wasn't able to pay any of the church bills and our mortgages and, we, and basically we just went bankrupt and we had to reorganize. Not really. Uh, it didn't affect me at all, but it did affect the people that didn't give. And I watched that. I've seen that before. I've seen people that uh, have asked the question. I've had people ask me this question, Pastor, if I'm in debt... And I think uh, like Larry Burkett and Dave Ramsey would teach this. If I'm in debt, should I give? Should I tithe or should I give to the ministry while I'm in debt because my debt's a bad testimony? Dave Ramsey would say, no, don't give until you have the money to give. I would say if you're in debt, probably you didn't give. And you probably are in debt to God as much as you are in debt to your creditors as well. But I've told people, that's a matter of conscience. I think it's a matter of conscience. In other words, you come to me and say, Pastor, I am uh, concerned about my personal debt and the testimony that I have in it. And until I'm out of debt, I'm not going to give to the ministry. I just say to you, it's a matter of conscience. I don't have a personal opinion about it. So between you and the Lord, and I'll agree with you about it. But I have observed that people that do that, generally speaking, never get out of debt. That's just my observation. And that's only my opinion. I mean, well, it's not my opinion. That's only my observation, I should say. And so that's an individual thing. I do think if you're going to make a decision like that, then you should make it for a period of time. And you would say, this is for this period of time, and you should stick by it. But I've just found uh, that when a person has a heart to not give, that they are more needy and that things come up. In other words, when, it, when a surplus or a windfall comes, then something also comes to take it away from them as well. And that's just really been my personal observation. Okay, now, these are all Pastor Price's opinions, but what does the Bible say about giving? Well, the Bible gives us the manner for it. We said, first of all, that one of the reasons to give, as supported in the Scripture, is for the ministers. But there is also for the ministering of the saints. Uh, look at verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. 
uh, in verse 3, Paul said, Whomsoever ye shall approve letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. So specifically, the saints are believers, righteous ones, hagias, holy ones, who are believers dwelling at Jerusalem. And so they're saints at Jerusalem. So they're Christians at Jerusalem. Now, why would the collection for the saints be sent to Jerusalem? And the answer to the question is because the believers at Jerusalem were undergoing terrible persecution and it was affecting them financially as well. They had need. Let's go to Acts real quickly and let's look at the circumstances at Jerusalem. Uh, the believers, those who got saved on the day of Pentecost, uh, let's, why don't you go to Acts chapter 2. But the believers that got saved on the day of Pentecost, which is what we're talking about in Acts chapter 2, they were baptized publicly the same day. Verse 41, the Bible says, And they glad they received His word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So 3,000 believers on the day of Pentecost were publicly baptized in Jerusalem. And what do you suppose might have been the ramification of that for those believers? They would have certainly been ostracized for following the Lord Jesus. They would have certainly undergone persecution. If you go through Acts, and it's interesting to do so, if you go through Acts and you look at every instance where many were saved or multitudes were saved or thousands were saved and baptized, you'll see that very shortly probably 50,000 people became believers. A lot of believers at Jerusalem. If you read Hebrews carefully, you would see that the destruction of Jerusalem was imminent. So being Jewish... Being Jewish and living at Jerusalem was already a problem uh, as far as Rome goes. In 70 AD, Jerusalem was sacked and every single Jew removed from there. And so things were getting warm by the time Paul wrote this letter to the church at Corinth. Things were getting rough for believers just because they were part of the Roman Empire. I'm sorry, not for believers, but just being Jewish. Things weren't well. On top of that, being a Jewish believer... Being Jewish meant you were ostracized by everyone who wasn't Jewish. Being a Jewish believer meant that you were ostracized by everyone who wasn't Jewish, and then you were ostracized by your Jewish friends and family as well. And that caused great financial hardship. That was a really tough situation for people. And so the saints at Jerusalem were needy. Have you all seen, um, have you seen advertisements on television uh, advertising giving to the poor at Jerusalem. Have y'all seen that ad? That's a nice ad, isn't it? Anybody here felt like giving to that? I, I'll tell you, that's one of the ones. It's like the you know the African starving African children. They they're tear jerkers. I mean, they really uh, pull at your heartstrings. And that would that would have been. I'm not being silly about that. See, that would have been probably similar, uh, of course, to a great much greater degree uh, to what it was like in Jerusalem at the time. In other words, there are a lot of very, very... We don't know poor Jews in the United States of America. We don't know uh, indigent Jews or impoverished Jews in the United States of America. That's just a fact. I'm not, that's, I'm not making a that's, a... that's just a generalized statement. It would be a very, very rare uh, Jewish person who's poor in the United States. But in Israel, and uh, certainly in that region of the Middle East, uh, there are many, many impoverished Jews. And that's a little bit of a foreign concept to us to because because of our point of reference. The Jews we know in the United States are very wealthy, generally speaking, or at least well enough off that they're not impoverished. Okay, now that was would have been the case, and that would be why the believers from around the world would have sent their bounty to Jerusalem. They would have sent, they would have taken up a collection and they would have sent it to Jerusalem. Read verse 45 with me, if you will, of Acts chapter 2. Uh, in verse 44, all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Okay, <clears throat> and so we see early on in the church, and you see it many places in Acts, that the believers there shared what they had because of the need there. So there were needy believers at Jerusalem, and the Jerusalem church gave to the needy saints. Now, let me just pause for the caveat there. They did not give to the needy unbelievers at Jerusalem. They gave to needy saints at Jerusalem. There are many individuals today 
that are mistaken about the purpose of the church. They think the church is supposed to dispense to poor people in general, but actually the church is supposed to take care of poor saints. And so I tell people this all the time. Some, many, many times a week I get phone calls, people wanting uh, us to pay their rent or to pay a utility bill or to buy them groceries or buy fuel or give them cash. And I tell people, come to church. Come to church and talk to us. And come be a part of our church. Come be a part of our family because family takes care of family. And if you'll come be part of our family, we'll do our best to make sure you're taken care of. And that's a fact. Now, there are families in this church that have taken people into their home and let them live with them until they got back on their feet. I've done that many times. Uh, we don't let, if there's someone in our church that is in that kind of a circumstance, we'll help them out. We'll do something for them. Uh, but there's no way in the world we could keep up with the uh, hundreds of thousands of people that moved to South Florida to be warm and indigent. There's no way we could keep up if the job of the church is just to dispense to whoever asks. So it's the needy saints at Jerusalem. If you would like to give to people that are indigent, uh, and you can do so with a clear conscience, and you feel led to do so, or for the cause of the gospel to do so, feel free to do so, but that isn't the response. That isn't what the church does. The church takes care of saints. It doesn't take care of, of uh, unbelievers. And uh, so go to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 34. Uh, this is after a great amount of people were saved. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold. Verse 35, laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Go to Acts chapter 6, if you will, please. This is when the church got deacons. And I'm going to ask you some questions, so pay careful attention as we read in Acts chapter 6. The Bible says, And in those days, when the numbers of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And here's where they laid hands on those individuals that were appointed as uh, the first deacons in the church. And their job of the deacons was the daily ministration of the widows and the needy in the church. Now let me just ask you a practical question. If it took six people, six men, to do the job of distributing daily to the needy in the church, was that a part-time job or a full-time job? That was a full-time job, wasn't it? Really, a deacon is a full-time position. Uh, we have qualifications for the office of the deacon uh, in, in the church, uh, given in, in, of course, the pastoral epistles. But a deacon is not somebody who's in charge of running or overseeing the church. The deacon's a person who's in charge of take, distributing to people, taking care of people in the church. Because the apostles said our job is to preach the word and to pray. And if we spend all of our time, uh, they recognized there was a problem. Yeah, obviously, the Grecians had a valid complaint because their widows were neglected. And the apostles acknowledged that and said, yeah, they are. And so we need to get some people to take care of them to do that. And they appointed people, and that was their job to do that. And I would submit to you, not only was it their job, but I suspect that they were supported to do that. In other words, they were supported as full-time deacons to do that. Uh, a deacon in the New Testament would be more similar to what, in the way churches function today, to what we know as an assistant pastor. Oftentimes an assistant pastor does a lot of tasks so that the pastor can be freed up uh, to preach and so forth. And that was really what a deacon did in the New Testament church, took care of a lot of those tasks. And uh, we don't have official deacons in our church. Did you know that? Why is that? Well, we're not opposed to it, and it probably will have some pretty soon. But the reason we don't is because we're following the biblical model. When did the church in Jerusalem get deacons? 
when the problem got so big that the apostles couldn't take care of it. And that, I mean, they, it wasn't being done with volunteers, so they had to get some people to do the job. And um, I don't want to be a renegade on this. I'm not creating some new doctrine. I'm not against what other churches do. But I think sometimes deacons are appointed to fill an office rather than appointed to fulfill a responsibility. And we'll, we will uh, appoint deacons in our church the day we need them. Does that make sense? In other words, as soon as it's, you know, we need a deacon. I'm kind of feeling like I need a deacon pretty soon. I'm serious. I'm, I'm not joking about this. But if we get a deacon in our church, I'd like him to be full-time. I'd like him to be full-time. I'd like him to have clear understanding of what his duties and titles are. And we'll ordain him. It'll be a serious thing. Uh, incidentally, a couple of the guys that were ordained, the requirements for them to be responsible for this was that they were full of faith and power. And then, so they, they went off and started preaching the gospel. Philip did, and Stephen did. And uh, they weren't much good as deacons because they got so into preaching the gospel, that's what they ended up doing. And uh, so, uh, I don't know how Nick and Orr and all the other fellows did as far as that goes. But I want us to have an understanding of what the purpose of the collection for the ministering to the saints is. Two things we've seen tonight by precedent in the New Testament, right? What are the two things? Taking care of the needy in the church or ministering to the saints, doing the ministry. Now, let me, let me pause there and qualify that and just ask a practical question. In the United States of America, might the ministering to the saints be somewhat differing than, say, in the first century church at Jerusalem? Might the needs of American saints be somewhat different than the New Testament saints in Jerusalem? How many starving people are there in the United States? How many starving people have you met? <coughs> Tragically, the only starving people I've ever met in the United States are innocent children who are living in the homes of druggy parents. In other words, you've got a two-year-old and mom and dad are so stoned out that they're not even aware their child's not eating. And it isn't for lack of resources, it's for lack of love by the people that ought to be looking out for them. It's an unnatural affection. Uh, but it's not because there isn't money or food available. Our government, unfortunately, has take, overtaken the task of the church, and the church has been glad to abdicate its responsibility to take care of the saints, and consequently, we've lost a lot of people for the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, it used to be if you had a need, you went to the church. Now, if you have a need, you go to the welfare office. And unfortunately, uh, the government meets the needs that the church used to. Uh, that's, just an, that's just an insight. But the purpose of ministering to the saints, the task of ministering to the saints is still a real one, isn't it? Uh, are saints needy in the United States of America? Well, they sure are, aren't they? It's just the needs are different than they were in the New Testament. And so the response is different. I just want to point that out uh, for us today. Okay, now, uh, we've seen several things in Acts and uh, chapter... Let's go back to chapter 16 again. And uh, let's finish. Let's look at the manner of giving. We looked at the reason or the purpose of giving. I'd like to look at the manner of giving. And I'd also like to support the concept of giving as well uh, in 2 Corinthians. Um, upon, in verse 2, the Bible says, Upon the first day of the week, uh, let every man lay by him, and let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, uh, that, I be, that there be no gathering when I come. Okay, so Paul said the way you're supposed to give is the first day of the week. Now why is that? Well, because that's the Lord's Day, and that's when the saints got together and worshipped. Uh, that, it's just probably the more important truth or the more important inference there is that the believers were together on the Lord's Day. And so I have an actual... Um, I have a solid objection to worshiping or to substituting Sunday worship or first day of the week worship for other days of the week. Uh, 
as long as I'm pastor, we'll never switch our Sunday service to Friday or to Saturday or do the same service Friday, Saturday, Sunday so you can come at your preference. Jesus Christ was risen on the first day of the week. Amen. And that's the Lord's Day and that's why the believers get together because we're celebrating the resurrection every single time we get together. And so we do it big once a year on Resurrection Sunday, but every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. We have 52 or so of those every single year. And so that's the Lord's Day. Now, I've said this jokingly, but I, I mean it. I've said, you know, the Bible commands that we, take, we, we gather for the collection, for the ministering to the saints on the Lord's Day. And I believe in taking the Bible literally and obeying every command of it. And there are uh, only a few New Testament commandments, and this is one of them. And so I've told people before, one of the reasons why we take up an offering, we could do it another way, couldn't we? Uh, we could get some fancy little gadgets on the backs of your chairs where you could swipe a card and you could give, or we could encourage you to give online. And you can give online if you like to. Uh, we could encourage you to send through the mail, or we could have a box at the back of the church and never deliberately pass an offering plate. And to be quite frank with you, I would prefer uh, to not take up an offering personally just because of the charlatans that have done so for their own benefit. In other words, I just the affiliation with passing an offering plate, I've been in some places where I'm like, you dirty thieves. You know, you're just here to steal grandma's rent money, and I don't want to do that. I don't want, to take, I don't want somebody uh, who's needy uh, to give so I can have a jumbo jet. That's not the purpose of giving. But the reason we give on the Lord's Day, first and foremost, is that it's commanded. And I believe in if God says to do something, I believe in doing it. And so I've told people, uh, if we were to take up an offering on Sunday morning and go and throw it in the backyard after we're done, I'd do it because the Bible says to do it. You get in other words, we didn't have any need for it at all. We didn't have any purpose. If we didn't have any, we don't know what to do with money. If we didn't know what to do with that, or we don't know what to do if people start giving bananas or something like that, we don't know what to do with what's given. I'd still accept. We'd still have a collection for the ministering to the saints because the Bible says to do it on the first day of the week. It's just part of the worship service on the Lord's day. Can I say to you? that a worship service without a collection on the Lord's Day is, is incomplete. I'm not saying it's not a worship service, but a worship service without taking up an offering is not doing something as commanded to be done. Amen. And so it's important for that reason. And the second thing about it that I say is, oftentimes when we take up an offering, is that it's just practical. It's embarrassing to me, beggarliness among believers. How many of you enjoy seeing believers standing on a street corner with a sign saying, God bless you, please give to the ministry? And they're asking people that are godless to give to the ministry. And I think it's a terrible testimony for the ministry that it isn't worthwhile enough for the people that are participants in it to support it, and they're asking for people that aren't part of the ministry to support their ministry. What a terrible testimony. And my question is, if it isn't worth your supporting, why should it be worthwhile for someone else to support? I've had Walmart call me in the past and say, would you like to uh, do a fundraiser and you could rent our hot dog booth or whatever they use? I don't think they have that anymore. They used to have a hot dog thing and churches could sell hot dogs and they could keep the profits for it. And I'd say, no, we don't do fundraisers in our church. We don't do fundraisers. Uh, I, you say, Pastor, will we ever do a fundraiser? I don't know. We never have. Did you know that? You tell me a time that we've ever done a fundraiser in our church where we've tried to sell something and then get a percentage off of it so that, um, so that we could raise money for something. I get calls frequently where people say, Pastor, the people in your church aren't giving. And we're going to come in and we're going to optimize your giving and we'll guarantee you 30% more and we'll only take 5% of it and you'll have 25% and so forth. And I think if our people don't want to give, I don't want them to give. But you're assuming our people don't give, and I think they do. I don't think, first of all, there's 30% there, and second of all, I'm not into taking percentages when it's to the Lord. It just doesn't make any sense at all to me. We don't do fundraisers in our church. Oh, we have giving in our church. 
And if people give grudgingly or out of necessity, the Bible says don't do that, for the Lord loveth a cheerful giver. And so if they don't want to give cheerfully, then I say, well, you know, get cheerful or don't give. Because God takes care of it. God takes care of the need of it. That's the New Testament way. Now, have we said grace yet? Josiah, put it down. I just said grace again. Oh, I did it twice. Grace, grace, grace. That's five total there. Okay. Um, so I want to look at grace giving very, very quickly. Look at verse 1 of chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the, what's that word? Grace of God. This is in 2 Corinthians. Did I not tell you to turn there? Yeah. Oh, I did. Okay. I, I hear a lot of people turning, so I thought maybe I didn't tell you. All right, we do you to wit, we want to make you aware of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, notice the word abundance is mixed in with a trial of affliction. The abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Sometime, if you'd like to, try to make sense out of that statement. Humanly speaking, it doesn't make sense at all. But I have come to understand through personal experience how much sense it makes. You know, it's incredible to me how much givers can give even if they don't have anything. There are uh, churches that brag about their millionaires. You know, we've got a millionaire. And, uh, you know, when you go there and you see their name on everything... A little plaque here, a plaque there. A plaque. We don't have any names on anything in our church. You notice that Pastor Price is particular about a lot of things you're discovering <laughs> this evening. We don't have anybody's name on anything around here. Given in honor. You can't ever get rid of something somebody gave in honor or got their plaque put on. And, uh, you know, we don't have, you know, the such and so auditorium and so forth. By the way, you're all going to hate me for this, but we had someone who was going to give us a million dollars, but they wanted their name on an auditorium, and they wanted to choose where the auditorium was. And so I told them, well, I'll talk to the church about it. And they said, I'm not asking the church. I'm, I'm telling you how I want to do it. It's between me and you. I said, no, it's not. It's not my church. It doesn't belong to me. They got mad and decided not to give us the million dollars, and we decided not to put their plaque on the door. And so <laughs> we were all even <laughs> for it. You say, Pastor... Uh, shame on you. If they'd given that million dollars, I wouldn't have to give anymore. Well, that's actually what happens in churches where millionaires give. Mm -hmm. Is people stop giving. And that's too bad, isn't it? Because it's more blessed to give than to receive. And it's too bad when a church is full of one blessed person. And everyone else isn't. You know what I found out? I found out that people uh, that just give as unto the Lord can give whatever is needed. And God supplies and I found out that people that don't have much can do amazing things. And when they do, you know that they did so by grace. That is God's ability and not their own. Now listen, if a billionaire... I'm not against billionaires giving, by the way. If you're a billionaire, please don't be offended. Um, we'll vote on the plaque thing. But, uh, I'm uh, the reality of it, I'm not against a billionaire giving. I, you know, you ought to give just like anybody else does. And you ought to give uh, by grace just like anyone else does. But the reality of it is that I want to know that God's in, in it when God does something in our church. And it's a marvelous thing, isn't it, when people... Uh, I remember a millionaire told me one time, he says, you know, I'm just really... He, he found out about our, you know, just our finances in our church. He said, I'm really surprised about what the people in your little church give. It's not very nice to call our church your little church in that way, by the way. But, uh, you know, the way you said it didn't make me feel good. But uh, he said, I just can't believe how the people in your little church give. And I thought, no, you probably can't. Because it's God that enables them to do it. In other words, it's, it's miraculous. It's divine grace. You know, that's pretty cool, isn't it? To know God's involved with what you did. In other words, I did this and God worked a miracle through me. That's pretty neat. And I found that I'm able to, if God lays something on my heart, I'm able to commit it and give it and God enables me to give it. I don't have it when I commit it. And it's not like I go into debt or borrow or do something foolish. But if I commit it to the Lord, God supplies it, and I'm able to give it. And that's just the neatest thing in the world. It's neat to know God's working in and through you. And one of the ways you can know God is working in and through you is through giving. And friend, that is the underlying motive for giving. The underlying motive for giving isn't, oh, if I don't give, then we're going to have need. If I don't give... No, the underlying motive for giving is I want to experience God's grace in my life. And that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? It's a marvelous thing. It's, it's just incredible 
uh, to be giving and uh, to, to be seeing God do amazing things. Now let's get down to verse 4 because we're over time by quite a bit, but it's just because I love preaching about giving so much. Verse 4, praying us with much entreaty. Oh, let's look at verse 3. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. What's beyond their power? Anybody ever lift a weights? You ever lift a weights with other people? Gone and worked out with someone, and you know, not everybody's an equal when you lift weights. You ever met somebody that, um, you know, you just knew they weren't very strong and turned out you were right? If, oh, I don't want to pick on the not very strong. Tony will work. Okay. If Tony and I were to go to the gym, right? And we were to lift at, you know, our youthful optimum. Tony, what's the most you're able to bench press? Five pounds. Like five pounds, probably. <laughs> so Tony benched like five pounds. I don't know what the most ever bench press was. Uh, maybe close to 300 or something a long time ago. I could probably bench 100 now, I'll bet you. But uh, maybe, so Tony and I were to go work out, right? And I would ask Tony to spot me, and I'm, I'm benching maybe 225, and we're doing sets of 10 or something like that. That's a pretty good amount of weight, right? So we're doing sets of 10. It's Tony's turn, right? And Tony says, Pastor, you know, I just really feel like I've been led to, to try the 225 today, and I'm led to do 10 of them. If Tony benches 225 10 times, something got into that guy because he sure didn't do it. You understand what I'm saying this evening? In other words, beyond his power, yeah, his strength. It's beyond his strength. And you know it's pretty neat when you give beyond your power. Beyond your power. Now, I'm not trying to say, oh, people, you know, give more money than you have. Now, I, I, I know preachers that get up and teach that kind of nonsense. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if God wants you to give something, and the Bible says in verse 4, praying us with much entreaty. How would you feel about taking $100 from a guy that didn't have five? How would you feel about taking $10 from a guy that didn't have five? You ever wonder what the disciples thought about the widow's might. I want to give it back to her, don't you? You're just thinking, you know, lady, you need this. Here you go. I want to give it back to her, but Jesus didn't. Or look at that aspect of when she threw everything she had in the treasury and you thought, now she's going to starve to death. Well, what did Jesus know about her? She wasn't going to starve to death. I've, I've heard preachers preach, yeah, she went home and starved to death. That was her last meal. Not on your life it wasn't. That's so out of the character of God. No, what happened is she gave everything she had and she went home somehow had more than what she gave. And that's how it works when you give. That's grace. That's how it works. And these individuals, Paul said, you know something, I don't think, I think we're going to pass over uh, Macedonia this year because I don't really think you guys have to give this year. And they said, please, Paul, don't do that to us. Please don't do that. Please. We want God's grace in our lives. Would you rob us of that? Would you have God not work in our church, in our midst? Would you have us powerless? We don't know if God's here. We don't know if God can do anything with us. If God can use us, would you just please let God use us? And Paul said, well, all right. And they gave. And Paul said, you don't even have that much. They said, no, but that's what God can do. And that's pretty neat. It's pretty incredible. And that's giving in the New Testament. That's why Brother John said you're miserly if you're a tither. A tither gives 10% of what they have. A giver gives more than what they have. There are times when it's appropriate to do so. Now, I've never, uh, I, I, I've never said, you know, everybody ought to give everything they have. I have, though, before. I have. You know, when we started Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church, I gave everything I had. Put my whole life savings in. We sold our house and we put everything in our church. Spent everything we had. <coughs> my wife and I did. Just invested it all in the ministry. I'm not ashamed to say that. Uh, if, if I felt led to do it again, I'd sell my house and give everything. I remember when... Uh, I, I don't. I wasn't alive at the time, but I remember reading Bill Rice, the, uh, Bill Rice, Bill Rice the Third's dad's book about when he went to Africa. Uh, some missionaries asked him to come to Africa and preach. So you know he did. He sold his house and took the money from his house. He rented a place with a little bit that was left, and then he took the money from his house and went on a uh, <coughs> was it a three month trip to preach in Africa. Saw hundreds of thousands of souls saved. But he used his life savings. Sold his house. Sold his family's home to do it. You say, Pastor, that sounds foolish to me. No, it doesn't sound foolish at all. It sounds foolish if God doesn't want you to. But if you're led to do it, my friend, you can get another house. He ended up with a 1,300-acre ranch 
ended up having the a deaf ministry that uh, is influencing influential deaf ministry in the world today. Influential around the world. That's what he ended up with. From and that's what God does when people give what they have. See, if you'd asked, you know, does Bill Rice have the money to go on a a, a three month trip to preach in Africa, funded at his own expense? The answer to the question is no, he doesn't. But he's got a house he could sell and do it. Would you? Would you? If God laid it on your heart to give something, would you just give? Would you just clean out your bank account? Would you sell your home? Would you sell your car? Would you? Say, Pastor, is that what you're asking me for? No, not at all. Never asked anybody to do that. But God might someday. And He knows He knows what's in your heart. And see, that's the whole thing. It isn't about who you give it to. It isn't about who gets it. Uh, by the way, you don't give it to a who. You give it to a him. It's God that you give to. And, it, and you shouldn't give to a ministry that you feel like isn't doing the Lord's work. If you don't believe it's doing the Lord's, there are people that don't agree with what the, the churches they're going to are doing and they still give to it. And I say, why? If you don't think they're doing the Lord's work, why would you give to it? That's foolish. Give to the Lord's work. Give to the ministry. And uh, the Bible says in verse 5, this they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. I enjoy reading this quote by Dr. John Rice. One time John Rice had someone that said to him, he said, Brother Rice, if... If I understand what you preach on giving correctly, I'd have you. Or I, I, I would think that you believe uh, that God wants a man's wallet. And he says, "You're right." He said, "That's what I. That's what I preach." He said. He said, but he said, you know, he said more than that. He said, God's not just interested in the wallet. God wants the pants the wallet's in, and God wants the man in the pants. And that was the believers here at Macedonia. In other words, if you belong to the Lord, then everything you have belongs to the Lord, and allocation is what giving actually is. In other words, God says, I want it in this bank account, so it's in that bank account, it's in your name. And then God says, well, I want it in this bank account, it's in this bank account, and it's in the name of a ministry. Or God wants it in this bank, whatever it is, if it's the Lord's, you put it where God wants it because it's His. And if God says, I want you in this town, well, then you ought to be in that town. If God says, I want you in this building, then you ought to be in that building. And if God says, I want to relocate you over to this place, then you go to that place. And guess what? Anywhere you are that God wants you to be, you'll have everything you need. And so you can give anything God wants you to. Isn't that a wonderful truth, believer? You could give 2% if God wants you to do it. You know, one of the things that I think is, is astounding as I meditate on it during an offering sometimes if God wanted you to put a penny in the offering plate and you put it in there, God would be pleased by it and He'd enable you by His grace to do so. And if God wanted you to put $10,000 in the offering plate, then He'd be pleased if you did and He'd enable you by His grace to do so. And you can just assign it whatever number. Do you know numbers don't impress God in the least? God isn't impressed whether it's a penny or a billion. It doesn't matter at all to Him. What He's impressed by is the heart of a giver. And that's what giving's all about. That's grace giving. Grace. I said grace again. Oh, I did it again. Grace, grace. All right, grace to you. All right, so now that's the point of giving in the New Testament. In other words, is the tithe abolished? Well, I don't think so. I think a tithe is a good starting point. You say, Pastor, I don't have any clarity about giving. Well, start giving and you'll get, you'll get more clear about it. You know, that, that, that'll happen. And a tithe is a good place to start giving. Matter of fact, if you have financial needs and you do not give, then there's a diagnostic there. In other words, that's the reason you're needy is because you don't give. Or givers aren't needy. And so there's a problem there. Start giving and God will start taking care of providing for your needs. Oh, how, how much do you start at? Well, I'll be quite frank with you. I don't really care to get involved with that. You say, Pastor, I'm an 8% tither. Um, I'll be honest with you, I'm not unimpressed and I'm not impressed. You say, Pastor, I'm a 50% tither. Don't take me the wrong way, but I'm not impressed, I'm not unimpressed. It doesn't really matter what I think about it, does it? I've never counted an offering in our church, so I don't know what you give. Uh, I, I'm not involved with that, because that's between you and God. 
And it's a response to whether or not you want to experience God's grace in your life and whether or not you want His blessing. And I just think that's a wonderful way. And you know what we've experienced at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church with that philosophy of giving? We've never had lack. Never had lack. Uh, I've had people look at our budget and say, man, I can't believe what y'all do for that much money. And I think, well, that's because God's blessing. It's God's blessing. And I've seen people that uh, look at it and say, wow, you know, y'all have a, whatever. However per person's perspective is, God's people don't lack not grace givers. And I hope that's a help to you. Father, thank you for what we've learned from the Scripture this evening. And I do pray that you would help us to absorb it. And may it be so that this would be a matter if any person here has a struggle over it, uh, whether there's a misgiving or a, a lack of trust. Or God, whether it's just misinformation where they are giving from the wrong attitude, grudgingly or of necessity or, or as though it's required. God, we want to give because we want to have your grace in our lives. And I pray that be the motivation and that this would be a grace-filled church. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Sorry it went so long. It's just a fun topic. And so that's why. Let's take some prayer requests for a minute. I understand if you've got to slip out if we've gone too long. <laughs>